Hola, bio, Casey bio. Okay, so today's um, screencast is a brief introduction to uh, Everest. We're going to be watching a film um, in the next few days, well, starting tomorrow, um, about summoning Everest and the challenges to the human body system. Um, what are they and what are the manifestations of um, those challenges physically uh, on the human body? Um, so, to start off, just talking a little bit about the mountain and why it is hard to climb. Well, obviously, it's very tall. Um, in fact, it is at the summit here. It is 29, ah, 29,029 feet. Um, so, quite tall. And obviously, you probably all know this already, but the reason why it is, well, part of the reason why it's so hard to climb Everest is that the concentration of oxygen, whoops, at the top is very low compared to the concentration of oxygen at sea level right here. Oh, maybe I should draw a boat. This is the sea. Okay. So, concentration of oxygen at sea level, much higher than the concentration of oxygen on top of Everest. And um, it's important to understand this because, well, and to understand how the lungs work, to understand the effect of this. So, at sea level, um, there's a lot, there are, there are many, many, many molecules of air all around. Very, the air is very thick down here. Um, but as you descend, or as you ascend a mountain, the air molecules become less frequent. Um, so the density of air is, or just there are just fewer molecules up at a higher elevation. So here, down below at sea level, oxygen comprises about 21% of the molecules, and additionally, up at the top of Everest, oxygen still comprises around 21% of the total air molecules, but there are just fewer molecules um, at the top. So the concentration of oxygen is lower. And this is a problem um, for breathing because concentration gradients actually drive the flow of molecules into and out of the blood. And let's talk about that for a second. So I'm going to insert a figure here. Okay, so here's a figure that's showing you um, gas exchange that happens in the lungs. So here is an alveoli. It's a single air sac, and you'll see it's surrounded by arteries and veins. And the blue is actually the artery, the pulmonary artery coming from the heart. And the red here is the pulmonary vein, which is going to go back to the um, right no, sorry, the left atrium and then left ventricle and be pumped out the, the aorta to the rest of the body. And the blood here in the lung is getting oxygenated. So let's look at how that happens. Well, you have a capillary here that would be, on this side, it's connected to the pulmonary artery. And it's flowing, um, it's, it's just surrounding one of these air sacs here. And so you have air that's just been inhaled from the outside here that's rich in oxygen and poor in CO2. So these small uncharged molecules move by simple diffusion from an area of high concentration, which is in the air, so oxygen is the area of high concentration here, moves into the blood and binds to hemoglobin in the red blood cells, and CO2, which is high in the blood, moves from an area of high concentration here to an area of low concentration here. So the importance here is the difference between the concentration of the air and the concentration in the blood. Now, as you know, when we summit Everest, the O2 concentration drops in the air. And that means the air is now less different than the blood. It's, um, it's like if we had a dam that was full of water behind this large dam. If it's hugely full of water, there's a lot of potential energy there, the difference between behind the dam and in front of the dam is very big, um, and so there's a lot of 
um, push or driving force spinning the turbine, um, creating a lot of electricity. But if the dam levels drop such that they're almost equal to one another, there's not as much pressure, there's not as much water flowing through the turbine, not as much electricity generated. Well, the same thing is going to happen um, here in um, for gas exchange in the um, lung. There's going to be no problem with CO2 diffusing out of the blood into the air, but there is going to be a problem with oxygen saturation in the blood because the concentration gradient difference between the air and the blood is smaller now. So that is the primary problem with climbing to the top of Everest this idea that your blood saturation of O2 goes down as you go up. So, what do people do when they're climbing mountains? Well, the first thing that they do is they go up slowly. So, this person's going to start out here and go a little bit up the mountain and stop and hang out for a little bit. And what's happening here as they stop is that they're beginning to acclimatize. And acclimatizing means is that they, their bodies are actually changing and um, responding to this um, deprivation of oxygen. And here are the ways in which the bodies are changing. First of all, their lungs are increasing in surface area and size. So what does this do? Um, it allows for more gas exchange to take place. Um, because, again, there's more surface area, and so um, the body is more effective at taking in oxygen. Um, the other thing that happens is that the heart grows larger. And um, this is important because it means that the heart can pump more blood around the body um, and deliver more oxygen to the tissues. And additionally, systems within the body um, adapt and decrease their O2 demand. So, and O2 demand goes down just in general across the body. Hi, Casey and oh. Kelsey. Hi, Darren Jay. And the last thing that happens is that um, there's an increase in the number of red blood cells produced. And this means that more oxygen can be delivered to the tissues. Okay, so as people are acclimatizing, these changes are happening in their body. Um, and then... Okay, sorry, I just had to stop because someone came in. Uh, I totally forget where I was. But anyway, people go, they hike up part of the mountain, they start to acclimatize. Um, well, they hike up part of the mountain, and then they just hang out, and they wait for these changes to start happening in their body. And um, then they continue up again, and, um, and then hang out again at a higher elevation. And there's some hiking up and down between these two points, um, but basically this whole process of acclimati acclimatizing can take upwards of um, a few weeks. Um, so people who are trying to hike Everest often land and spend a month um, just getting ready to even attempt a try at the summit. Um, and so you'll see that in the film that we're going to watch. Um, people are going up and down between different camps. Um, so they start out at base camp, which is at 17,700 feet. And then they proceed up to um, camp one, which is a little higher, which is um, 19,000, I think 900 feet. And then... There's Camp 2, which is 21,300 feet. Camp 3, which is 24,500 feet. Camp 4, which is 26,000 feet. And 26,000 feet is just at this point that we call the death zone. 
And this is the point at which um, there's no more acclimatizing. Uh, basically, once you p pass the death zone, um, or you pass into the death zone, it's um, there isn't enough oxygen in the air to sustain life, and everything is... Um, human body systems start to shut down, so it's just like a ticking time bomb until you are dead. Um, so, 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 so once you reach Camp 4, you only have so long to hang out there until you have to descend um, to more oxygen-rich air. Um, and you'll start to see in the climbers that there are physical manifestations um, of this deprivation of oxygen, um, both physical and their ability to like, climb the mountain, but also cognitive. Um, because they don't have enough oxygen, they are not bringing enough oxygen to their brain, and um, they start to have cognitive deficits as well. So this film explores um, both the physical exertion as well as the cognitive impairments that occur as climbers attempt to summit Everest. Um, okay, I think that's all the information that you need to know for the f upcoming screencast, and yeah, okay.